Good morning. Uh, our Sunday school lesson today comes uh, from the book of Mark, uh, and it's a, a very familiar lesson uh, uh, about uh, the loaves and the fish. Uh, we're going to entitle the lesson, Breaking for Lunch. Well, the church of my childhood was not a little brown church in the veil. Uh, it was a little white church on a small hillside. Most of the men in the congregation were employed in one of the local textile mills, where after five days of the constant noise of the looms and putting up with the cotton dust and fiber mixture that filled the air of the weave room, they were ready on Saturday to head to the lake. There was nothing like lake breezes and hungry fish to revitalize their spirits and prepare them for a day of worship on Sunday. By late afternoon, uh, I'm sorry, by late summer, when the lake water had warmed and the fish weren't biting as well, it was time for the annual fish fry. The fishermen were eager to vie for bragging rights for donating the most fish, the biggest fish, or the tastiest fish as they celebrated together and the entire community was invited to share the meal. Five nearby churches joined us and brought various musicians to entertain the crowd as the children played drop the handkerchief or tug of war. Then dinner was served. The fried fish were piled high on serving platters and bowls of French fries and slaw were plentiful. Everyone ate as if they had been starving themselves for months in preparation for the feast. But even the gluttonous frenzy could not deplenish the amount of food that had been prepared. So after the meal, everyone was given take-home plates and still leftovers remained. These were carefully boxed up and volunteers took, took them to shut-ins who could not attend the event and to the two local nursing homes in the area. The cooks and the fishermen were praised for their efforts, and the fishermen quickly began making plans to ensure that next year's event would exceed the present one because there was always the record-breaking fish that got away. You know, uh, when sermons tend to run a little long in churches today. Uh, you can look around the congregation and, and people are glancing down at their watches. Well, I don't think that happened in Jesus' day. Uh, watches weren't that prevalent for one thing, but it was Jesus that was speaking. Well, I'm going to read now from Mark, the sixth chapter beginning with verse 30 and going through 44. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him everything they had done and taught. Many people were coming and going, so there was no time to eat. And he said to the apostles, Come by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. They departed in a boat by themselves for a deserted place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them, so they ran ahead from all the cities and arrived before them. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. Late in the day, his disciples came to him and said, this is an isolated place and it's already late in the day. Send them away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat for themselves. He replied, you give them something to eat. But they said to him, should we go off and buy bread worth almost eight months pay and give it to them? He said to them, how much bread do you have? Take a look. After checking, they said, five loaves of bread and two fish. He directed the disciples 
to seat all the people in groups as though they were ha as if they were having a banquet on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, broke the loaves into pieces, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate until they were full. And they filled 12 baskets with the leftover pieces of bread and fish. About 5,000 had eaten. The apostles had just returned from a variety of special missions. The mission experience is not specific as to which apostles ministered to which person or people, but we know they had been sent out in pairs to heal, to purge people of demons or evil spirits, and to preach repentance. They had been instructed to take no food or money with them, because the people to whom they ministered would assist them. Jesus needed his followers to know that God provides for those who serve him. As the disciples regrouped to share their mission efforts with Jesus, there were so many people converging on them that Jesus suggested they seek a quiet place where they could rest. They discovered, however, that the people saw them leave and figured out where they could be going. They then ran on foot from their various towns and were awaiting Jesus when the boat pulled up to the shore. Jesus rewarded their determination because he knew that they hungered for the message that he would share with them. The disciples who hours before had been ecstatic about their personal missions expressed their concern to Jesus that like themselves, these people had not had a chance to eat, and they were in a remote area where food was not readily available. Would it not be good to advise these people to find their way to a nearby town or village where they could purchase food? They were then shocked by Jesus' reply to them, You give them something to eat. There were thousands of people in the crowd, and the disciples calculated that just to provide a little bread for each person would cost at least eight months of wages. These were men who had just returned from an experience of miraculous healings and dependence on total strangers for food and lodging. But the gigantic crowd before them was intimidating. When Jesus asked them, to determine how much food was available, they probably were laughing inside as they reported they had found five loaves and two fish. Almost no one had thought of bringing a lunch because they were in such a hurry to meet Jesus. The disciples were even more shocked when Jesus instructed them to divide the crowd into groups, some in hundreds, others in fifties, Perhaps as they did this, they were not thinking in terms of the exodus when the 12 tribes banded together with their respective families. And they perhaps were even more astounded as Jesus took the loaves and the fish and offered a prayer of thanksgiving before he began breaking up pieces of the food to distribute to each disciple with instructions for each of them to begin sharing it among the people. Imagine the conversations among the groups as they shared the meal. And consider the disciples. It began to sink in that they were participating in a miracle beyond their greatest imaginations. And when the people had finished eating, the disciples gathered 12 baskets of food that had been left over. Although each of the four Gospels include this account, none of them provide further details about the way any specific one of the disciples processed it. They had witnessed healings. Some had perhaps seen or at least heard of the changing of water into wine. Recently, the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, had been raised from the dead, but still the disciples had doubts. 
They had personally been able to take part in healings and had been nourished when they were in the company of strangers. But still, they doubted. The men that Jesus had specifically chosen to become disciples still had a long way to go in order to allow God to govern their lives and actions. They, like most of their families and ancestors, were still looking for a militaristic Messiah who would establish an earthly kingdom and elevate his people to rule. These men did not yet know that the bread to sustain the lives of God's people was living among them as a human being who would offer his body as a sacrifice, not only for their sins, but for the sins of the world. They were yet to learn that their human existence would entail times of darkness and pain, but that those times could be weathered in the knowledge and faith that there was an eternity of love and peace that awaited them. It would not be until the death and resurrection of Jesus that the, the disciples understood the true depth of God's love. They had helped make miracles take place, but they had not recognized the miracle that was taking place inside each of them. They were ordinary men who had been chosen by Jesus to share the light of God's love with the world. Grady Nutt once described discipleship as one beggar sharing with another beggar where he had found bread. There's still a world of hungry people who desperately need even the crumbs that we can share with them. One of the greatest legacies of Inman United Methodist Church is a willingness to share. Before the COVID outbreak, the Monday morning breakfast welcomed anyone in the community to join the church members at the table, and no one was treated as unworthy. Homeless men and women shared a meal with businessmen wearing coats and ties as each of them enjoyed the fellowship and the sense of being neighbors. For those who needed other resources, the food pantry and the clothes closet were available. Surely, this is the kind of fellowship that took place as five loaves and two fish became a hearty meal for 5,000 people. Probably most of the huge congregation didn't know that the origin of their feast came from such a meager supply. But they could enjoy the meal and the fellowship with one another because God's love is not reserved for a select few. It's there for all who are willing to accept it. The warmth of that love may begin with a mere spark, but that spark must be in the hearts of those who are willing to share along the way. Let's pray together. Dear God, help us to not merely dine at your table, but to share with those who hunger for the love and compassion that you offer to each of us. Amen.